Grove. And where's the church? <laughs> to the uh, school board candidate forum here tonight um, to hear from the candidate candidates that are going to be running for the school board election that will be coming up shortly. Uh, before we get started, uh, I'll kind of lay down a few ground rules, not that there are a whole lot of them, some expectations. Um, just make sure that any questions that are asked here, they're not direct personnel questions that they can't really talk about or answer. Um, and try to keep our questions from trying to attack any of the, the current board members, especially those that are running for re-election here. I don't want to try to get them caught in a gotcha type situation here. This is going to be more to get to know the candidates, what they're about, what they're running, what their platforms are. So try to keep your questions related to that sort of thing. Um, I know I'm, I'm kind of excited to hear from everybody. I've lived here for 19 years and I don't remember the last time we had a school board election, let alone nine folks running for open <laughs> positions, so this is pretty exciting. Um, got a couple of hours here that is scheduled, so we're trying to get through as many questions as we can. Um, I've got a couple to get us started, then we'll turn it over to any out here. Um, I know there's a couple in the crowd I recognize that asked some questions on Facebook. Since you're here, I'll let you guys ask those so I don't have to. Um, what I think might be a good plan, if you guys agree with it, uh, we'll just start on one end and go down, give everybody a chance to answer the question. If you'd like to, try to, you know, one to two minutes, don't need a 10 minute detailed laid out plan. And then for each question, we'll just start the next person over so everybody gets a chance to ask an answer a question first. That works? Yep. All right. Now with that, I'll kind of break down a little bit of, of what is open and what we're going to be talking about as far as open spots and terms. I, uh, there are two three-year terms that are open uh, for election, and Jason Uphoff, Jared Hone, Lisa Wilbur, and Troy Randall, incumbent, are running for those two open spots. There is one spot of a two-year term uh, with Daniel Glammeyer, Sam Pickard, and Angie Kafer running for those, and a one-year term spot that uh, Karen Elizabeth, er, sorry, sorry, <laughs> got that wrong, it's Elmer. Now everybody knows my middle name. Sorry. <laughs> I copied it. It's <laughs> Elmer. And Commit <clears throat> Bullock is uh, running for that one-year term. So to get started, we'll do a quick uh, background, why you're running for the school board, uh, some qualifications kind of uh, that will get to know you. I'm going to start for Sam. He sent me this nice little one-page memo to read for you guys <laughs> as he is out traveling with the baseball team uh, today. Uh, so I will read Sam's and then I'll let you guys take over and then we'll see if there's any questions out uh, here to start with. Um, so we'll start with Sam. Has been involved with the Del Rapids School District for 14 years, him and his family. And as a result, he's seen and experienced things at many levels. Uh, Eve has worked as a substitute, a bird professional, 
Michael, a teacher in the special education department and as a building secretary. She's worked in both the, uh, in all, all the schools, all three buildings, the elementary, middle school, and high school. Uh, their kids have been able to experience benefits of all levels of the school, from pre-kindergarten through graduation. They've utilized some of the special education, what they've had to offer, as well as some dual credit opportunities. Their kids have been involved in sports, music programs, and the high school play. Yeah, he said these experiences have given a wealth of perspective, which he believes would be beneficial as he serves as a member of the school board. Part of the reason that him and Eve moved to Del Rapids in 2010 was the Del Rapids School District. Uh, at a meeting early in 2023, our leadership was discussing the future. Uh, it was brought up community growth and its impact on the school district. And he says, as a person I respect, uh, a person he respects made a comment regarding the need for intentional and possibly hard decisions in order to ensure we are best prepared for what the growth could mean for the school. So he wants to be a part of a group looking 10 to 20 years in the future and beyond to be sure schools are prepared to best teach and equip students for many years to come. And this is necessary to help ensure Del Rapids is an amazing community well into the future. Now more than a decade ago, Eve and him took the time to put in writing goals they have for their family. Among those goals were raise our kids to be confident in who God made them and equip the kids to pursue the career interests they believe God has for them. This led them to decide to be involved in local schools and is a large part of the reason that Eve has worked in the school for as long as she has. Uh, even though their kids may be about finished as students in the school district, uh, mentioning that Curdy has two years left, this is one of the reasons he's running for the two-year vacancy versus the one-year or the three-year. He wraps up here his experiences, personality, interest in preparing for the future, and desire to help people become who God created them to make him a great, as what helps him make a great choice for the school board in 2024. So that's his little write-up. I know he mentioned on Facebook as part of this event that if anybody does have questions, uh, you can reach out to him. He'd be more than happy to answer anything that may be asked here. So with that, turn it over to you guys. Am I going first? Yeah, okay. <laughs> I'm Jason Uphoff. Uh, thanks, everybody, for coming. I'll just, we'll do one thanks for everybody, right? So thanks, Desiree and Paul, for having us here. Thanks, Matt, for moderating um, and everything else you do. We appreciate that. So uh, my wife, Amber, and I and our kids, we moved to Dells in 2018. I own Journey Painting. Uh, we own the Aria across the street. I got four kids in school. Uh, from third grade all the way up to Hallie is a senior. She'll be graduating this year. One in, at least one in each school, I think. Um, my why is, is really simple. I want my youngest daughter to have all the same career opportunities that my oldest daughter had. I really believe in all the things that she participated in uh, throughout high school here. Um, I do recognize that there's going to be a few challenges and some good opportunities going forward and I think uh, the way to mitigate those challenges and take advantage of those opportunities is by strategic planning. Uh, kind of along the lines of what Sam said, right? So we need to look into the future, decide what it is we want to accomplish, and then plan backwards from there. I am Lisa Wilbur. My husband Brian and I have lived in Del Rapids since 2002. Uh, we have one daughter that graduated from here two, three years ago, uh, and then we have a daughter who is a seventh grader currently. Um, I am a former educator. I taught for uh, eight years in the Sioux Falls School District as a CTE educator. Um, family and consumer science specifically. Um, and then I spent uh, some years in the daycare sector, and then I spent four years uh, running Haven here in town. So um, I think that equips me to kind of be knowledgeable about education and what, um, what teachers are needing for support, which I think is a big thing. As we continue to grow and as standards are set, set by, at state levels, we need to provide support for our staff and our teachers um, to allow them to be individuals still within their classroom and to have the effects on their students that they can have. Um, that's one of 
you know, the things that I know can be very frustrating is to kind of feel very micromanaged sometimes within the classroom. And so that's something that's kind of important to me. Um, I also think as we, as Dells continues to grow, which I think is evident by what we see around us, that we have to be prepared for the future and we have to continue that, that growth and continue to be the strong school that we have shown to be. Um, we need to keep setting those strong standards. Um, and I think that includes in providing opportunities for all students. Not every student is an athlete. Um, not every student wants to do fine arts, but we have to have all those different opportunities for those students because those are the things that really help shape our kids into being good adults, um, helping them find what is important to them and allowing them to explore their their passions um, and to find out who they are um, and to give them a place where they can be themselves. So um, those are kind of my big whys is, you know, just that support for our educators because <coughs> without them, we don't have a school. Um, and then providing all those opportunities for all the students that we serve. My name is Angie Caper. Um, I graduated from Del Rapids. I grew up here. Um, now we moved back, my husband and I moved back before my oldest um, went into kindergarten because we love it here. Um, so I've been here almost 15 years. He's a seventh grader now. And then I have two kids in the school district. One is in seventh grade, my oldest, and my youngest is in sixth grade. Um, <clears throat> my background, a little bit about me, I'm a registered nurse. Um, so I, my background is not necessarily in education specifically, um, but I do have a little bit of background with management experience. Um, after I went into nursing, I started in neonatal intensive care and then I went into the clinic to a triage setting. From there, I went and got my certification to become a, a certified coder, medical coder. Um, and then I took a management position and ran um, an orthopedic coding department. So I had some, uh, just some management background. Um, so just understanding how things work and being able to get perspectives of a lot of different people, um, opinions of a lot of different people, being able to lay out, um, you know, what are the benefits, what are the <coughs> risks, you know, what are, we, you have to, you have to take a lot of different opinions <coughs> into consideration um, to make an educated decision. And so um, I think that, you know, being able to be a good listener um, and try to understand those things um, is really important when you're sitting on a board like a school board. Um, so some of the reasons um, that I'm running, um, the biggest one for me in particular, there's, there's several reasons that I'm running, but the biggest one for me in particular um, is because I have a child who is in the special education um, department within the school district, and I think that there is a need um, within the district to to identify struggling readers. Um, I could talk all day about um, some of that, but you know, if some of you have specific questions for me about what that has meant for us, I'll just say it has been um, a long road from the time we were in early childhood to where we are now, and I think we need to find ways um, to identify those kids at, such a, at an early age in the elementary school and then start putting interventions into place to make them um, you know, more successful readers so that once they get up into the middle school um, age, when the curriculum gets a lot harder, um, they're gonna be able to better understand what they're learning um, and comprehend and be more success successful. I just don't wanna see, um, you know, I think all students matter. All students are important and I don't wanna see anybody flying under the radar just to pass them through and out the door. Um, so that's a big passion of mine. Um, Another reason I think there's opportunities to look ahead for growth. Um, and what are some of the things that we can maybe implement to um, support all of our students? Like Lisa said, not all kids are athletes. I fully support our athletic program. I have a child who's very into athletics as well, but I also have one that's not. Um, and so I think, and, and so I might have, um, you know, I, I'm a huge proponent of the arts. Myself, um, when I gradu graduated from Del Rapids, I was huge into the fine arts um, myself as a student. Um, and uh, some, of you, some of you know me, um, I sang a lot, I still do. Um, it, it's something that um, has given me lifelong um, skills and I have a huge appreciation for fine arts. So 
I think it's really important to support that. I think it's really important to support athletics. I think that we can look at ways to even support kids that might not do either of those things. So another thing that I'm interested in looking into is implementing um, programs like STEM, robotics, um, supporting those kids that maybe have a passion to have hands-on experience, learn some of those technical skills, which also um, helps them grow and learn, um, you know, just lifelong skills, being able to stand up and um, talk in front of people um, and be able to you know, present what their project is, how they did it, all of these things. And some of those kids, um, and again, if you want specifics, I have ideas on how <coughs> to implement some of these things. And I, so I know some people who have um, built these things from the ground up in other s districts, so I have ideas on how we could try to get something like that up and running. Um, but just making sure that we are supporting all students, thinking ahead, strategic planning. Um, again, I agree with that fully. Um, you have to look at the big picture down the road and what are some of the things that we might be encountering coming up? What considerations do we need to make? What preparations do we need to make? Um, and asking some of those questions and start planning for the future. Um, so I have quite a few reasons, I guess, in a sense that um, I have chosen to run. And again, if you have specific questions on any of them, I'm happy to answer them. I'm Karen Zomer, and my husband Scott graduated from Del Rapids, and my parents and I um, live outside of Trent, and so I also grew up here. Um, when we were getting married and planning to raise a family, we always knew it was in our plan to move back to Del Rapids. It's a great town to raise a family, so that was our plan, and we've been here since my oldest started kindergarten. He graduates next year, which is terrifying to me. <laughs> um, and I spent a few years in the elementary school as a paraprofessional and then also as a substitute teacher. So I have seen some of the behind the scenes of our schools and seen like, how hard our teachers work, how much our teachers care about our students. Um, and I tend to get a little bit intense in these things because I do care so much for our students and our teachers on our school system and that is one of the reasons why I'm running. Um, I found out recently that there is not as much transparency in our school board and with our administrators as I would like. Um, there is a change made where there's no longer seventh and eighth grade art and that it hugely impacted my son where that is his favorite class and he just entered seventh grade and the only reason he was excited to go to school and granted I get not everybody's in art and whatnot but it was the spark that got me started coming to meetings and looking at the agenda and looking at the minutes and listening to the discussion and what I'm finding is it's really hard as a parent to know what's going on. The agenda is very vague, the minutes are very vague, the discussions at the meeting is very vague. And so it's like digging for information. And I'm not someone that wants to be against you, I just want to understand what's going on. And if I'm frustrated as a parent that can't find information and understand what's going on and impacting our children, other parents are frustrated too. They've got to be experiencing the same thing that I am. And so that's what I really want to see change during my time on the school board is have a very clear agenda so somebody that's not in the school system can know exactly what's being talked about and not have to guess, well, what does this mean? You know, because it's some letters and words that don't make sense if you don't have the packet. I want them to be able to read the <coughs> minutes and know exactly what was discussed and who is for something or against something and why. You know, we used to live stream our board meetings, so if parents couldn't make it because six o'clock on a Monday night isn't always the most convenient time when you have kid activities all over the place or you work in Zoo Falls and trying to get back in time. Um, I want it accessible for everybody to be involved. I think that's one of the things that's absolutely amazing about Del Rapids is how our parents and our community shows up. Um, just look at our Christmas concerts, our band concerts, our music concerts, any kind, our 
athletic games, any kind of activity that we have in Del Rapids, this community shows up in droves. Like we don't have parking. I feel like it's a, you know, a NCAA event where you need to have shuttles driving people to the event because everybody in this town, whether they have kids in the activity or not, they show up. And we need to facilitate that participation and get the parents and the community involved. And when we're looking at this forward planning and expanding our schools and our town is growing, we're not gonna be successful in that if we do not have the community and the parents all on the same vision working together. And that's what I wanna do on the school board. I talk with my hands. I'm sorry. <laughs> I didn't do my job. Or I'm sorry. 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 i am schools uh so uh, uh let's see seventh ninth and eleventh grade is where our kids are are at right now um i i gotta tell you when we first moved to del rapids i i frankly had not spent a whole lot of time here I, i'm an honest guy sometimes brutally honest we hadn't spent a whole lot of time here fell in love uh immediately when we got here we really liked the school district and as our kids got into high school one of the things that i really realized i loved was there was so much variation and opportunity of the classes that they were taking. My kids were being offered things like ag and carpentry um, and welding and things like that. And I thought that was absolutely fantastic because me, um, I, I'm a, a contractor so I'm a, and, a, and a developer. So I own um, Glymire Homes, uh, president, owner, whatever, Glymire Homes. So we build houses and we develop land um, all around the area. And so I thought it was incredible that there were these, um, these additional classes that were available to my kids. And, and the more time that we've spent here, the more involved we've been able to get uh, here in Del Rapids. And, and the more we've really enjoyed um, being a part of the community and being a part of the school. And so, you know, my wife, she joined um, the Fine Arts Booster Club and I started uh, working um, to, to, to build some of the sets for the plays. And I, I tell you what, at first I thought I'd just be out there swinging a hammer and now I realize, boy, I really like doing this with the kids and watching the kids light up when they learn how to use a saw or use my nail gun. Um, <laughs> it was a little scary at first, but they, they really like it. Um, and, and so it, it was kind of just a lot of that love for the school that, that go, hey, you know, I, I really think um, I'd like to run for school board because as much as I love everything that was going here, I also see that we're kind of at an inflection point here in Del Rapids. So I, I get to a lot of the communities around Sioux Falls, obviously, and, and um, I see what grows communities and I see what stifles communities. And what I hear from people as we're, we're building houses for them is they'll come to us and the school district will be the number one choice in where they decide to put their home. The biggest investment of their entire life and it will be based on the school district that they're going to be in. I've had people decide not to buy a half million dollar house from me and instead get one across the street a lesser house, of course, because it wasn't mine. <laughs> Only because across the street was Brandon School District and my house was Sioux Falls School District. And so when people come to me, what I hear from them is, I'd really like to be in the Brandon School District, I'd like to be in the Harrisburg School District, I'd like to be in the, the T School District. T is the up and coming school district out there right now. Uh, unfortunately, what I'm not hearing is I want to be in the Del Rapids School District. And that is why I want to run for school board. Um, this wouldn't be the only board that I'm on. I'm on the board of director for the Home Builders Association here in town. Um, I'm treasurer and on the board of directors for the South Dakota State Home Builders Association. I have a lot of experience with growth and this town's about to go through some real growth if the community can get behind it. Um, but now's when it gets hard. Now's when partnerships start to happen. Now's when you get out and you gotta make those tough asks of the community to get this thing done. But, um, but now's when it gets fun too. When you can really start investing in all those programs and growing and there's, there's opportunity to partner 
with the CTE Academy in Sioux Falls where we could just blow up the number of classes that are available to our, to our kids. Um, and I'll just ramble on and on. So I'll stop here because um, I'll, I'll talk more when I get to questions. But that, that's why I'm here. I, I, I want to help. I think I have the skills to, to help. And I think I can help us lead down that road. Uh, my name is Lee Bullock. Uh, my wife, Brittany, and I moved to Del Rapids 10 years ago. My wife is from Del Rapids, born and raised. Uh, we have four children, uh, third grade, fifth grade, and two seventh graders. Um, my, I've been on the school board for five years. Uh, my why behind that is really just, um, like Angie, I'm, I have a nursing background uh, and, in, and in leadership. So um, I currently serve as an assistant chief nursing officer at Avery McKinnon. And I just really love that strategy piece and, and trying to drive excellence. And I really think that we've done that at, at Bell Rapids. Um, there's a ton of pride, uh, as Karen mentioned, around um, our athletic programs, our fine arts, our school in general, uh, and I think we've done a really nice job of maintaining that through some really challenging times over the last couple few years, you know, including COVID. Uh, I think that was kind of a, a challenge for every district, and I think we did a really nice job of, of kind of coming out of that on a good in a good way. So, um, obviously, we have new leadership in the school. Uh, we have five board positions open, so uh, just also hoping to provide some stability as we as we change and grow. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Jared Holm. My wife and I have lived here in Del Rapids for 20 years, moved here in 2004. Our oldest has already graduated from uh, Del Rapids and is up at the state. We have three kids still currently in the school district, a junior, a sophomore, and a fourth grader. Um, our kids have kind of spanned the academics, athletics, and arts. And I think if you're looking for my why as to why I'm applying to be a member of the school board, it's to kind of, we've had to, as a family, deal with that balance of all of those things. And I was to provide that as a member of the school board if elected. Um, if you look at qualifications for me, um, I, um, I have a healthcare background as well. I spent 20 years at Avera McKinnon in radiology and radiation oncology. About 15 of those years was in leadership, um, managing 60 plus staff, running 24-7. Um, so I have kind of the leadership strategic planning um, budget mindset that I bring to the table. And with that medical background, I also think I value research and studying situations and kind of understanding the outcomes that come from them. Um, in the past three years, uh, I've worked with the Presentation Sisters in the nonprofit sector focusing on ecology, prairie restoration, and education. In the last two years, I've had the fortunate capacity to work with the Brandon School District. We've been bringing some of their kids out to a farm and doing the education that, that also matches curriculum that was set by the state through for K through five uh, programs. And we've also worked with the summer school program in the Sioux Falls School District. So I've had some experience working with administrators and teachers and engaging them on what we're trying to do. Um, I would say in addition to that, uh, for the last five years I've been on various boards. Some of you have seen me as a member of the uh, Athletic Booster Club. I've been on the uh, Lutheran uh, Church Church Council for four years. And then currently I sit on the board of directors at the banquet in Sioux Falls. Um, and I think having that variety of board experience um, on top of the leadership prepares you for the different Everything that I've been a part of has been an onion. There's many layers to a decision. There's many things as you make decisions that you can impact with those decisions. Um, but again, like I said, I'm trying to bring, I would bring balance and I think stability to the, the position of appointment. All right. Um, I'm Troy Rambo. I've lived in the district for 52 years. Um, I graduated from Young Rapids High School in 1990. Um, went off to USF, graduated there with a the business administration and came back to Dallas, so I've been here my whole entire life. Um, I have been on the school board, I think, 17 years. I, I did not double check that, but I think that's what I'm at. Um, I thought about that, and I've talked to my wife, and she's like, how long are you going to do this? And, and this will be my last, if, if I am elected, I'm done. I just, I'm passionate about one thing, and I'll talk about that when it comes up. Um, I have two boys that graduated in Del Rapids. They're at SDSU and at Lake Area. Um, this has turned into the 17 years. I, I, I am, well, what, what do I do? I sold my farm, so I'm, I'm part-time valet. So I have a ton of extra time. I am extremely fortunate that I have the time to put into this. 
Um, so the school board has kind of became my hobby that I'm very <coughs> passionate about. It, it, it is what, what interests me in my other part of my time. Um, I, I, what I'm trying to do as a school board member is provide the most rounded education to take a little pre-kindergarten student and turn them into a graduated senior that can go out and function in our society. That, that is what drives me to do this. Um, it's not the pay. I was paid $207 for the last three months. So <laughs> it is not a pay, pay thing that we're, none of us are in for that. There's, there's no one here for it's great we have this much interest. I'm excited that we have people running. Um, I guess that that is what, I, what I'm running for that I would tell you is I'm really interested in CTE. It's been brought up a bunch. I think that's the last part. We, we focused on dual credit as a school and we kind of got that going. And now I think there's this other section of students that maybe we aren't getting to, like you said, and maybe we can, we can do some things with the community and get our CTE program built up. So that is my last push here for my last three years. So that's it. I guess. I guess we'll get through about two questions. <laughs> was state lawmakers are increasingly trying to define more of what happens in a school district if and when the state proposes or passes policies that a school board collectively feels is contrary to the interests and values of the community what would be the role of the school board in that decision super easy <laughs> 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 I go first again? Okay. Oh, we can mix it up. No, it's fine. All right. So you might hear this from me more than once, but the, the short answer is is fight. To if if you're opposed to what the state is saying that education should be in our community, then you fight, and that might be a, a, an easy fight or a hard fight. And I think you. Um, have to stick to whatever it is you believe in when you decide it, as a community you believe in. I'm just going to bring that back. You're going to hear me say strategic planning like 400 times tonight, so I'll just apologize ahead of time. But if we if we have a plan, it's kind of like what Troy said, right? So a strategic plan for our school district, you know, this next board that gets elected, are, are sort of taking on the educational life of the preschoolers and the kindergartners for that year, right? So. This plan has to look forward at least 13 years. If you can kind of pave them, then maybe 15 years, right? So we need to project forward. We need to think about not only do it, what we want the school to look like in the next couple of years, but we want, what we want it to look like for those five and six year olds. And once we've decided on that as a community, uh, we need to stick to it. Um, to kind of give an example of, of a thing that came up at the last school board meeting about legislation coming down the pipeline, right? You got this sentinel law or whatever that they passed about uh, having an armed guard on the school campus. You know, that's kind of, I don't, I don't like to preempt fear, so the, the sentinel law doesn't really make sense to me. Uh, it's kind of what the superintendent said too. You know, we have a good SRO, we have plenty of, of coverage in our community. Uh, that's an example of something that, you know, you can kind of, quietly fight by just ignoring. Um, if you need to, then you, then you take it up, you know? So. Can you read it again? <laughs> <laughs> I need the short version. <laughs> that would be great. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> if or when state proposes or passes policies, the lawmakers that the school board collectively feels is contrary to the interests and values of the community or the school, what role will the school board have in fighting? What, did, what should they do? Uh, I mean, ultimately, 
you know, as a school district, as a public school district, we are bound by those state regulations, state policies, things that are passed. I mean, that's, that's how our government system is set up. However, um, I think when there are things like that that come up as a school board, that is something that needs to be, you know, talked about. And okay, what does this look like specifically for our school? And I think within all of those kind of different policies, there is usually different pathways that you can kind of address and maybe formulate to work better for your school district. Um, and so in cases like that, I think you have to come together and say, okay, what does this look like for us? And then ultimately, you know, if you can't kind of find that way, then, you know, kind of playing off with his, you do have to kind of give that pushback. And, you know, then, okay, we need to be a voice within, you know, state government, you know, from our district and, you know, standing up for what we're speaking to. Yep. <laughs> I, I, I completely agree with that. You have to sit down and you have to have that conversation with each other, collectively come up with what, what are the reasons this, that we are against it, um, and make a plan as a group. Um, and then if we have to utilize our community resources, our, our legislators here in, in Del Rapids, from Del Rapids, from our districts, um, we can start with them and we try to get them involved and, and you know, if we have to keep going from there, you keep going from there. If it's something that you're absolutely passionate about fighting, but like Lisa said, if it's a mandated thing, you're, you know, you're mandated, so you certainly can try to take it up as far as you're able to take it, um, and I think you should, um, if it's something that absolutely seems like it's gonna be a detriment to our students. Because we, at the end of the day, need to be looking out at, for the best interests of our student body and community that we live in. I agree. Um, you know, ultimately, we, we represent you guys. We represent the community, we represent parents and the teachers. And so it is our job to do our best to support what we as a community believe in. And if something is coming down that we're against, it's collaborating with the community, collaborating with different organizations and our lawmakers to make our voices heard and help everybody understand why we're against it. And maybe there's a shift that makes it, you know, not something that we're against or we can make it better. But it's really that working together with the community and I think that transparency and engagement with everybody is going to make it better because one voice is a lot quieter than, you know, 4,000. So if we can work together, we can hopefully prevent something from coming down or, like they said, you know, find a way to make it work for a district where it doesn't affect in a detrimental way. So th this is a topic of something that I actually deal with in a different way, but I deal with it all, all year, every year. And so, um, you know, in the business of building houses, we are always keenly aware of what's going to be happening out in Pierre and what's going to be happening um, nationally when it comes to our building codes, specifically our energy efficiency codes. Um, and so those decisions that they make can significantly increase the cost of a house um, and, and make it significantly more difficult to create affordable housing in our community and a number of other problems depending on what they um, what they enact. And so um, I what the correct approach is not to let it be done to you and then try to deal with it. The correct approach in those kind of situations is you have to get ahead of it. You have to know that those conversations are happening and the only way to do that is you have to be connected uh, with your legislatures. If there is going to be legislation that's introduced that's going to affect your school and you disagree with it, you need to be on the phone, you need to be out in peer, you need to be representing and talking to people so that they make the right vote for you while they're out there. And it's not a dirty th thing to be in politics when it's all for the right reason. Um, and and when, it's, when it's for our kids and for our school, um, that's what I believe in. Because my approach to how our teachers should teach um, and, and how they should be told to teach is not, it shouldn't be legislated. They've been educated on how to teach. And, and we mostly just need to get out of the way. I mean, that's what I need, what I do in my own business, is I don't go get in the way and tell my framer that I know how to frame better than him and he needs to do it my way. I need to give him a plan. I need to trust he knows what he's doing. 
I, I know I have inspectors that are going to come and make sure that it's done correctly and my crew's going to go in and double check it once he's done. But you know what? When, I, when you entrust them to do what they know how to do, um, you will always get much better results than dictating every single piece. And so um, that's the kind of conversation we need to have with our legislators um, so that they understand what we're looking to do. And, you know, the proof's in the pudding. When you're putting out kids who are educated and well-rounded and all those kind of things, you don't get people coming to try and mess with you. Um, it, it, it's just, it's no longer, um, it's no longer a top-line item that they're worried about. Uh, so there's a few different ways that uh, the board currently addresses it. I think it's worked well for the most part. Um, so each year we select a representative that will kind of, um, if we need an email or some sort of um, uh, response written, then that person's responsible to speak on behalf of the board. Uh, we also are part of a large school district coalition that has a lobbyist, and that person will speak on our behalf as well. Our superintendents, Dr. Schultz, formerly and now Dr. DeBoer, are really good about staying in tune and keeping us updated on what is the legislation coming down and how will that impact our district. And lastly, uh, our representative, like Mr. Pischke, here tonight, um, they're really good about being engaged with us and listening at least to our concerns around various uh, legis legislative bills that we um, either support or don't support. So that as a collective kind of uh, plan has worked well for us uh, going through the last several years and I would uh, think that would be a good model going forward. So when it got to me, I was going to say I really don't know what the capacity of the school board is, so thank you for educating me. <laughs> <laughs> That's the truth. Um, what, what I was going to say, independent of that, was just I think a lot of pro proactive ed uh, education needs to happen. Anybody who's elected to the school board should be kind of lockstep with what's going on. They should be researching. They should be talking about it amongst themselves. They should be talking with the community, kind of getting feedback as things are happening, not being uh, retroactive to stuff. <coughs> um, if we're retroactive to stuff, we have an opportunity to impact it, at least in the the immediate future. Uh, changing things takes much longer, um, so I think proactive approach is much more appropriate. Yes, and I agree with what Lee said. What we do is when they're going to start the session, we will get every bill that is going to do with education, and we start to look at that. And then we have our, our lobbyists, we have our small, our large group, and our small, we've kind of been involved with both, because we sit right in the middle. We're not a big district, but we're not a small, so we, we're involved with both sides. Um, and right away, we're doing that, looking ahead. And the next way is, is if we see something that's coming that we're really, we'll, set, we'll do policy. We'll, we'll, get the, we'll get ahead of the bus and get out there and have a policy so if it does come to tuition, we've already are ready for it, ready to go. So that's, that's kind of how, our, how we've done that, so. Anybody brave enough to ask a question yet? <laughs> Let me get through my list pretty quick. So I can see right, we go. All right. So uh, listen, you guys, a lot of great ideas. Um, great ideas from what I've found is they come with a lot of expense and which is oftentimes the situation is like this going to be a new expense, a new thing to fit into a budget. Um, where do you guys see our district, uh, our, our low hanging fruit, our, our opportunities to move that budget around, save money in certain areas to maybe institute some of these fantastic ideas for our students' futures? <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, in all honesty, I can't sit here and tell you exactly what that would be because I, as a, just a person who's not currently on the board, we don't have a lot of input into the budget right now. That is a school thing. So until you're in and involved in that process, um, I'm an accountant by trade, so I, I do budgets, I know budgets. Um, budgets are a plan. Like, you know, you, you can put the best laid plan out there, but you're going to have to maybe adjust and shift and stuff as it goes on. Um, but, you know, sitting here, I can't tell you we would cut this and we would put this in and we would do that because we just, as just a private citizen, I guess right now, I don't necessarily have the tools in front of me to know what a, a budget would look like for, for that and how we would necessarily rearrange those things. But ultimately, I mean, the budget process is 
it's very important within the school and knowing kind of what's important to the community and what's important to our students and what's important to our teachers those things are all those things that go into planning that budget and and it is a, a delicate balance to keep it and make everybody happy um, because we are have very limited amounts of money you know as a public school we don't have endless funds so you know you do the best you can with what you got and try to make everyone happy Okay, so admittedly, I'm, I'm not an accountant, and I am not the budget person, but I think it's important that you have um, differing voices on a board. So um, while there might be somebody who has an area of expertise in that, my area of expertise is not that, but um, as far as like addressing your question, so how, how do you implement some of these things? So um, like I said, um, sometimes it's bringing in people who know things about these right so I know somebody with, with the stem thing like for that um, that for example um, I, I called him up I said how did you implement this from the ground up because I know this individual who did and he grew it from nothing to now running 16 different robotics teams in the program and they actually have implemented the programs in the district and his budgets are running close to forty thousand dollars they've done it um, in different ways when they started there's there's programs you can get through like South Dakota State University for free he said we called it we called it junk robotics at the time. So you get shipped a box of you get all these um, you know different things that are within the box, and then the team has to build a robot from it. Um, and you can implement those things with um, a very limited budget to begin with. Um, he said probably about a thousand dollars is all. Um, and and how you get that is you can do sponsorships. You can also look at grants. There's a ton of grant opportunities out there. So I think that we would need to look at. Where can we find extra money? Are there grant opportunities out there to start implementing some of these programs? The way that he did it was looking into opportunities like that and then continue to grow it. Then the district was able to find a small amount of money to kind of throw at it, and they were able to add it in as an actual course curriculum. So it started as an after-school project, um, extracurricular for these kids that were interested in it. Um, now they have buy-ins where um, parents, they have parent coaches um, who help out the program. Their kids can uh, participate in the program for free if they if they volunteer uh, so many hours per se to kind of help run some tournaments and do different things. Concessions, they raise money that way. So there's there's outside of the box thinking, I think, that needs to happen when you're trying to implement some of these programs when you don't necessarily have a lot of budget dollars to do it. Um, but there are, there are there's money out there. There's there's free money out there. There's ways to get it through sponsorships, through grants. <coughs> we need to think outside of the box because I think there's a ton of opportunity. Um, and like I said, I am not the expert as far as like actually creating the budget and knowing where to pull from and give to and that kind of thing. Um, admittedly, that is just not my area of expertise. Um, but I have ideas of, of how we can implement some of these programs in different ways so we don't necessarily have to pull budget dollars from what is our core curriculum. I agree wholeheartedly. Um, there's, I've heard a lot of things about grants out there and that schools aren't utilizing them because the grant writing process for the application is so intensive and difficult. And so for that, I would love for us to work on maybe having someone that has the experience and that I and mean, we have excellent writers in our school our teachers are amazing so it could be a possibility of them taking on that role um, but applying for a lot of grants to help fund some of these things and the creative thinking outside of the box um, the other thing is collaboration we have a lot of resources and talented people within this town and like I said this town shows up so if we come up with a program or a plan and the town is on board, I'm sure that we can find a way to make something happen. Um, and I think partnering with St. Mary's, they're a huge part of this town and I know some of our struggles with funding is because of the whole you know, private versus public school. I remember when we were trying to pass the, for the um, new elementary school and that it was difficult. And I think if we can really partner with St. Mary's and have 
that part of the community also on board and if they see it's a benefit to them as well and the community as well we can really have the whole town on board and it's going to make funding for things a whole lot easier um thanks for the question casey i i was a former banker so this is right <laughs> up my alley you know, you used to bank with your brother a little bit so um there's lots of low-hanging fruit. You have to know how to go find it. Um, and if you don't know how to go find it, it will pass right over you. Uh, you know, in the development world, sorry, I'm gonna stop, be a broken record and keep tying everything back to what I do, but that's how I've learned. There is money available for developers to acquire land, to put in infrastructure. I mean, people may not know, when you develop a piece of land, you have to put in the sewer, you have to put in the water, you have to pour the concrete, you do it all, and then you give it all back to the city and they get to take care of it forever. So you have to do all the work and they get the, the benefit of it. Um, but there's money there to do that. There's money there for schools too. And there's also programs that we could be taking advantage of right away that would fall in budget too. And the one I referenced before was the CTE Academy out of Sioux Falls. The reason I mentioned CTE Academy is because they are currently partnering with just about every school district around the Sioux Falls area, except for Del Rapids. Um, they currently offer 15 of the 16 accredited CTE courses that are nationally accredited or whatever it may be um, to our students. So just example, I wrote these down so I can tell you. Finance, aviation, agriculture, construction, computer science, AV technology, health science, tourism, human services, integrated English, so English learners have an opportunity there too, uh, STEM program, someone brought that up, robotics, auto body, auto technology, and welding. So the reason I talk about a partnership is the reason, the same reason Sioux Falls built the CTE Academy. They built it all in one place, so not every school would have to have these 15 programs in-house and have to pay for 15 teachers. That is an opportunity for us to offer 15 new courses to our students at a lower cost. We just have to reach out. Um, and I, I happen to know Josh Hall. He's the... Um, he's the... Uh, uh, He's the head of the school down there, I suppose. And um, I, I just got some basic information. And, and they have they have the ability to handle more students. Um, they, they've mastered what this looks like, and they're ready for us. And all we have to do is reach out and ask for them. So that's just one example. Um, and I, I'm the vision guy. I want to spend some money because spending money, it, it, you have to invest. Um, and spending money is what's going to make money in this town. When you bring additional people to this town, they will help that budget as well. Uh, and, and so one of the things that I've got out there right now is I would really like to have um, a performing arts place in our high school. And we have started doing some of the best performances I've ever seen. The plays that we have done for the last three years, two years, three years, have been absolutely incredible, and we shouldn't be doing them in a cafeteria. That shouldn't. I'm sick of sitting in those chairs. I'm sick of all the work that the kids are putting in to be feeling like, and now the table's even got worse. So, <laughs> so big money, right? We're talking big money. Um, so I, I sat down and I was talking to Jason and I was talking with Karen and I, I said, I got this big idea. I want to get it done. We deserve it. Kids deserve it. The teachers deserve it. The work's being put in. This can be something that we're known for. This is how we start having our school be well known to bring people to the community. And when you put people together uh, with big heart and lots of ideas and strategic thinking, they said, well, you know what, the, the city also needs a space like that, too. And I went, oh, yes, of course, a partnership. That's what it takes for big projects. So then you start partnering with the city, and they're kicking in some of that money to get that built. And you see what grant money is out there, and you bring that in. And you know what? You find someone who wants to invest in their legacy and put their name on the building, <laughs> and then you bring in some money, too, and that's how you get big projects done. It doesn't always have to be a tax increase. Sometimes it does, but it doesn't have to be. Um, but if you can get 90% of it done with all that other money and you, you invest with that 10% from the community, I hope the community is on board for 10%, you know? Uh, so, a couple things. Um, 
I think from a capital outlay, our, our capital outlay fund is very strong right now. So I think any of these projects, that whether it's a CTE wing or fine arts building, we are well positioned to be able to do that at this point. Um, so I have comfort in that. I do agree with um, whether that's a foundation or some way to engage the public for, for fundraising and those sort of things to do bigger and better projects, I think is, is a great idea. Um, I'm going to steal Jason's answer here a little bit. A lot of it does come back to strategic planning and what does the board as a whole uh, feel is the best in the best interest of the most students. So I think that's where it, that's where it lands at the end of the day. And so just using the dollars that are allocated towards us and, and funneling that to the best uh, interest of the district. Um, I'm not going to sound like a broken record. Everybody that has spoken so far, you've given great ideas. And the only thing that I would find a gap in what has said so far is just leveraging partnerships. You talked about it a little bit, finding both public and private support for different situations. But I think um, when you're looking out, you can't just look at what we have in Dells to look outside of that. You have collectively here tons of years of professional experience. Along the way, we've all made friends who have either connections or input. And I think sometimes those need to be uh, researched as well. Um, what are other what are other schools doing? What do we have? What do we have going on elsewhere in the state? But leveraging those partnerships too, on top of all these other great ideas, I think is extremely valuable. And having, I want to say the flexibility, but the willingness to go out and take the extra time to do that, regardless of who's elected to the school board, is going to be a necessity. I would agree. I think it's completely partnerships. <coughs> When, when you said that. I've been on the budget committee for 17 years, so I do have a little bit of this, and it's extremely tough in a public school. The ratio is we get so much from the state, it's how many students we have, and then that's our money. And then we're, try, we're trying to spend that in our general fund. That's what we're trying, so it's extremely difficult. And we all know what teacher salaries are, all right? So we are working as hard as we can to try to get those up. It's very tight when you start looking at the budget. There is not a whole bunch of, whoever gets elected will see that. Um, there's not a whole bunch of low fruit there. And I think our capital outlay is exactly correct. That's what we will have. That fund is good. Um, we have a bunch of projects that are getting paid for in the next two years, a year. Um, and, that, and that's going to give us this opportunity to do any of these ideas that have been brought up. The Fine Arts Center or the CT wing. Um, he talks about going to Sioux Falls. It's very expensive to go to the CT in Sioux Falls. And I also think my vision is why would we not do it here and invite Flandreau and Coleman and Chester and those towns that aren't going to go to Sioux Falls and do a wing here. That, that's, that's kind of my vision when I talk about CT. So that's it. It's totally different when you're the last one. Yeah. <laughs> so that, uh, that question evolved, I think, by the time we got to the end. So I'm going to answer the, the question as you asked it first, as I saw it, and then I'm going to talk about the teamwork piece that evolved as we went down the line, right? So my first instinct is how do you make the money stretch? So my first instinct is always micro-economize, right? I don't believe in cutting a, a big program. You can usually find little pieces throughout that you can turn into to one piece that you can use, okay? Uh, secondarily, this is even my idea. This, this, this came about in a conversation with uh, Dustin Berg of the clinic. Hopefully he doesn't mind me dropping his name, but he was talking about how they do, uh, essentially they do a CT internship at, at the clinic um, where kids can go and they can go through all the stations at the clinic and learn you know, what it is to, to draw blood and what do the nurses do, what do the doctors do, whatever. And that conversation with us evolved into, well, if you, what if you had a designated hour in which we, as a community, figure out a way to have a CTE hour or whatever, and then that alleviates that number of students times that hour throughout the week in, in dedicated uh, teachers that we have to assign to them, which then, you know, loosens up the grip on the budget a little bit in the long term. So I thought that was a really good idea. Not my idea, but I'm just sharing it with everybody. Uh, going to, to how the, the question evolved, and all awesome stuff. I've had this conversation with Dan and some other folks. Uh, and actually, I think Lee has done some footwork on the idea of a, of a community center or, a, or a, um, a fine arts center or whatever. There are tons of opportunities. Uh, I think 
I think Lee spoke with Rita Anderson, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so before we, before we lived in Del Rapids, I, I, uh, I worked as uh, director of an economic development company up near Brookings. So I worked with Rita quite a bit. And her story is really cool. I don't know if anybody's been to the, to the DeSmet Events Center. Um, but part of the story she doesn't always tell in public is that she had a, a community member, a business owner who'd been in the community for a long time, came back and said, you know, basically, here's, here's, a, here's a bag of money because I want to get back to the community. And that started her journey. But over many years, she championed this idea and it all comes back to this what we're talking about with, with teamwork, right? So how do you get something like a fine arts center, community center built? Uh, it starts with the great idea. It starts with a whole bunch of teamwork. It starts with one champion and one patron. And then there are tons and tons of grant opportunities. Um, we have uh, an organization just down the road in Renner called Dakota Resources. They, mostly work with economic development groups, but um, they have, they're, they're a kind of organization you go to and they will line up the players for what you want to do. And just off the top of my head, for something like, like a community center, a fine arts center, uh, you have the Bush Foundation, you've got Yield Giving, that's um, Jeff Bezos' ex-wife, right? So mm -hmm. those, those two grants, um, specifically play off that. And if you tie those into to one community patron and one champion and a whole bunch of people who want to make it happen, uh, I've said before in a lot of forums, and I really believe this, people love big ideas. It is as ridiculous as it sounds, it's easier to raise $10 million than it is to raise 10000 because people love big ideas. And if you can build off of a big idea that everybody's behind, I don't see the money as a challenge. I see it as an opportunity, and some of that works. Some of that works already been underway. So, I think that's questions. So I am relatively new to Del Rapids. I've only been here for about four years, but my daughter she just started in kindergarten this year, so I'm really getting to see the school system, the opportunities we have for our kids, and as a small town, we do great. This whole meeting has been focused on development, our future building, because as we've seen, we're getting the Sioux Falls community, we're expanding. I mean, the amount of housing that's coming into town, the companies that are coming into town are amazing. So right now, we're set as a small town school. I wanna know, what your idea of the future is looking like. So whether that be we putting money into expanding the academics because we want to get, you know, we want to get those collegiate classes going. Do we want to be sending kids to Sioux Falls and focusing our development on that growth for the CPE program? Do we want to be getting, um, do we want to be getting in with the colleges in the surrounding area and bringing classes into our schools. Um, when I was growing up, I took advantage of everything. I was a three-sport athlete. I did all of the um, music programs and all the arts programs, and I did the collegiate classes in school, so I saw the whole spectrum of it all. So I want to know where you think we should start expanding first, whether that be expanding the athletic programs we have, whether that be expanding the arts programs, getting that funding going to develop an arts facility, which would be amazing, or whether it be to start expanding our collegiate classes and broadening that aspect of the school system. Okay, so, <laughs> so honestly, for me, um, I would really like to see us implement um, before we even look to do any of that, um, some sort of a reading specialist program. Um, put within the elementary school to help identify, like I said, those struggling readers. Uh, my, my daughter um, is dyslexic and she also has a developmental language disorder. Um, if you start doing the research on dyslexia and, the, and how common it actually is, and then how um, unknown it actually is, um, it's, it's classified in the school as a 
specific learning disability, you know, the state of South Dakota now does recognize dyslexia. Um, but when I say reading um, challenged readers, um, many of those are going to be dyslexic. Um, but maybe there's not, maybe there's other, other learning disabilities that these kids have. However, I think fundamentally, at the very basis of every child's education, it, it boils down to they need to learn how to read and they need to learn how to write and they need to be able to do it proficiently in order to be successful as they go throughout their school career and then into the real world, right? We all need to be able to read and we all need to be able to write. So fundamentally, I would like to see us implement that first and then look to implement other programs. So I would, I would like to find the money to implement the reading specialist um, within the school district first before we go in. And then I would say after that, um, you know, we have pretty good support for the athletics. We have the Booster Club that raises a lot of money for the athletics departments uh, for those programs. I, I would like to see um, more done for the fine arts programs. Um, so I think that that would be important to look at. Um, and then, um, you know, making sure that we are not losing programs, like, like I said, with the, with the middle school. Um, you know, I, I think we lost the teacher in middle school art, and then it just wasn't ever re-implemented. We didn't get somebody else in that place. Like, we shouldn't be going backward. We need to be going forward. So we need to make sure that we are keeping those programs in place um, and not losing them, and then we need to go from there. So that's, I mean, I guess, in a nutshell. Where are our problems? What do we need to fix first? And then where can we continue to expand and grow on those things that I think would be great ads, great ads that teach kids um, you know, life skills along the way. But fundamentally, we, kids need to be able to, to read proficiently, and they need to be able to write proficiently, and they need to understand what they're reading, understand what they're writing. Um, so I think um, that's where my passion lies. I want to see that implemented first before anything else. So for me, one of the things is teacher retention. Um, we have amazing teachers and coaches here, and um, we seem to be losing them. And so I would want to find out how we can improve our teacher retention. Um, there's a teacher shortage, and getting good teachers into Del Rapids may be a challenge. Um, I said we don't have a 7th and 8th grade art teacher, and whether that's a budget issue or being able to get teachers in here, I think it's an important part of the curriculum for our school as a whole. And like you said, not going backwards on programs. I think our athletics department is amazing. Um, we have great teachers um, in our academics, but if we lose our really good teachers, our academics gonna be strong still. So that would be my big thing is teacher retention and then um, refilling that seventh and eighth grade program, filling that hole in our art and expanding on it. Um, I have a son that will be a junior next year and he has not been able to get art one in high school because the classes are so overfilled for art. There's such a high demand for that art class and we have one teacher teaching fifth and sixth grade art and ninth through twelfth grade art. And there's not as many opportunities then for the expanded art classes. Um, so that would be something that would be important for me is to expand that art program. Um, and I would want to make sure that we keep our music and band teachers because they have done a phenomenal job of growing our music department. When my oldest started in fifth grade, they were just starting over and it was a drastic change over the last several years and we should all be so very proud of our music department. Uh, thank you for the question because I, it's kind of exactly the reason we wanted to have this forum is to, is to talk about, okay, what, what's the vision? What's next? Frankly, that seems to be what's missing. Like, we're not hearing um, any big ideas. And, and when you're just treading water, I mean, you're growing or dying, right? And, and um, it, 
budget's not magically going to fix itself. New courses aren't magically going to create themselves. We, we have to have a vision of where we want to go. And so I, I've shared a couple of those things already. I mean, the CTE thing is it's important to me because obviously it serves some of my business. I mean, we are um, desperate for, for, con for contractors, for framers, for plumbers, for electricians, and these are high paying jobs. Um, these are guys with lake houses and boats. You know that, I mean, these are low paying jobs. And, and you can have a job tomorrow if you have these skills. And so I see that as, as, a, as a quick return is really what it is. I love the idea of it being here um, in Del Rapids. That's, that's a five year plan. I'm all for talking about a five year plan. What do we do next year for my kids that are going to be in school and for all your kids that are going to be there next year? That's what I want to talk about now because we can have a one year plan, we can have a five year plan, we can have a 10 year plan. Um, but we got to have a plan. that those kids are gaining when we're out there and 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 working with them are, are we're not going to teach them all to be actors they're not all going to be singers that's not why they're there the kids that I'm there working with they're learning tools they're learning leadership they're learning public speaking skills they're learning all of these things that really matter to me when I hire high-level positions um, and so that's what we need are good well-rounded kids and those aren't the those skills are not going to come from all your standard courses. All those things are really important too, um, but the the added courses. How to put this? We we have them right now, but we will show what is most important to us by what we give the time to. And right now. The time is not being given to those courses. It's being taken from those courses and being put in other places in order to meet whatever goal. And we need to have an all of the above approach to education because well-rounded kids are the ones who are successful out in the real world. So I think uh, as a board, uh, one of the best ways to kind of address your answer is really listening to kind of all stakeholders. So at the end of the year, parents are given a survey or sent a survey that they can fill out and send back to the board and we look at all those responses and that helps give us some direction. We also listen to our educators, we listen to our administrators, we listen to our stakeholders within the town. So you're kind of trying to take all those different um, pieces of feedback and make decisions that are best for the district both now in the short term and the long term. So an example I'll give is CTE, um, a fine arts center, that's kind of a long term uh, investment, capital investment. Short term risk right now is our teacher base pay. So that is something that we need to probably address this coming year probably, even that, that short term, to say how do we get our teacher base pay up to a more competitive level um, within our area. So. Really, it comes back to just listening to the stakeholders, and then as a collective, saying what is the what is the information we're being given, and how do we make a, a decision that's in the best interest of the district. Um, what was your name? Uh, ask the question. I'm Haley. Haley, thank you. Um, a lot of what you brought up as you're talking about your uh, being a student when you were younger. A lot of my kids are kind of dealing with all those same things. Dawson will probably kill me for bringing him up, but he was here, he left a little bit ago. <laughs> um, so it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> what, do I, what I found about all of my kids is a teacher connection. And when I think about your question, if I was to answer it honestly right now, that's where I would stick to is finding, maintaining those teacher connections, but balancing that with the needs of a growing community. We have tons of people moving here. I've heard from some of the teachers that we have this wave coming through the grade school right now and it's not gonna get any smaller. So it's balancing the size with balancing that teacher connection. Because without the teacher connection, we can talk about projects, we can talk about doing these other things, but if we can't do that simple thing, that's gonna be a big issue. So that's where I would say I would have to delegate my attention to first. If I'm looking 
I don't know what the answer is, but if I can maintain that future connection, that's where I would start. All right. Um, one of the things you said, you know, you, you talked about your child hasn't been able to get up. We, we just changed our scheduling, and we're hoping that's going to address those problems that we just did at the last school board meeting. We're going to hope that we can put some help into that. And the other thing that you brought up was was the teachers that are leaving. It, it, it's, it's terrible, but they're leaving the field. They're, they're not moving to a different district. They aren't saying Del Rapids is terrible. They're deciding that they want to go do something else because the pay just is not there. One thing we keep talking, and I know this is unheard of, but Del Rapids enrollment is not growing, which is affecting our budget some. Um, we all think it is, and we look at the new homes, but for the last several years, our enrollment is steady. So, so people are either just not having children or we're not seeing it yet. We, we keep waiting for this class or a few. We don't want huge growth, but we sure, you know, being stagnant, the only way we're picking up additional budget money is through an increase in the valuations of people's homes because we're picking that up through capital outlay. But we are not seeing this giant increase in students, um, which I wish would come. I, the part I think when you said what would you prioritize, and I've already made that, I, I think it's CTE. I think we've added the dual credit. I think we've done a lot of things there. There are areas in the elementary school I'm sure we need to work on. I'm not, I'm not but, but CTE to me is just like he said, it, it's an area that maybe we can produce some kids, um, get them out there, their path is not college. And, and we can get them an opportunity. And some of those kids when they get out of school, even though it just takes two years to get it, they don't do it. And if we can get them a year into some CT classes or something, maybe we can just get them to <coughs> keep going and wind up with some more, some more well-rounded kids, I guess is what I'm hoping. Yeah, again, all good stuff. They get to work off it a little bit. So uh, retention was mentioned like in three different forms, and I think retention is huge. And not just because I think we have good teachers, but uh, you know, I read a Gallup report recently, and the crux of the report was that for the first time in history since COVID, uh, white collar workers, the number one thing that they, they want addressed when they're applying for a new job is money. It's never been that way before. It was always more altruistic, right? They wanted to live their dream or whatever it was, but it, that's not the way it is anymore. So white collar workers, blue collar workers, they're both, the first question they ask is money. What that means is, is that there's no longer any cost savings in, you know, maybe you have a teacher retire and then you get a, a brand new teacher. Um, I, I, was, I was interested in the statistics in the Gallup report, so I just ran the math on, on our school quick, because I wonder how it affected us. And in fact, so this has nothing to do with what they get paid. I think the teachers deserve their pay. Uh, the group I used, for my quick little analysis was our administrators because we, we had an interesting situation where we we have two administrators who have been here uh, for two years, but more or less we've had turnover so we can address um, the difference between what are the, 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 the two administrators who've been here for a couple of years, what is their increase in salary year to year, and then I could look at what's the difference between the ones that left and we had to re replace them, right? And what I found was is that Year over year for the administrators, the increase in the salary was about what you would expect. It was about around 3%. And the cost to get the new people in <coughs> was an increase on average of 11%. So almost four times as much. And I'm sure, you, yeah, I'm getting some head nods. So that's, it's, it's not just because we love our teachers. It's, it's a practical answer to a lot of the problems we're going to talk about tonight, I think. And, and it's an opportunity. Let's keep our teachers because we love them, but let's also keep them because it makes sense financially. Um, and then I just want to, I told you I'm going to say strategic planning like three more times. I just want to punt off that a little bit and just talk about the process real quick. Um, and it started tonight. Everybody here together, uh, your question is the kernel of strategic planning, right? Um, so what does the process for something this big look like? Well, um, we talked about exit survey. Something we may did about exit survey at the end of the year. That's a great place to start. Let's talk. Let's get a survey of, of all the stakeholders and shareholders in in the Del Rapids education ecosystem. 
and begin there. And then as we go forward with strategic planning, we can expand that process. And again, I already mentioned Dakota Resources, but they do this sort of thing for communities. Um, and there's, there's a tie in there, right? So we were also, we have all new administration at the school. We also happen to have essentially all new administration at, in all our nexus points of economic development and development in the community too. So we got new chamber, we got new economic development director, we have a new city administrator. So there's a lot of new block, right? So we have a blank slate that we can kind of do whatever we want with, but first we got to figure out what that is. So I'm kind of, I didn't answer your question directly, but that's because it is the question, right? What do we want to do next? And that's not any one of us answer. I, I, I hope there's 4,000 answers that we can bring together and turn into a plan that does address next year and it does address four years from now for the next um, life cycle of graduating classes at the high school and it addresses 15 years into the future for those six-year-olds who are just you know joining us so it is really hard to go last <laughs> <laughs> all the things have been taken and then you seem like a copycat no, um, I think ultimately um, our job as a school district is it's to educate and the people's whose job that is is our teachers and so giving them the support they need and that you know, tied to what Lee says, um, that base salary, we have to be able to compete. We have to, especially with our location, we have to be able to, to pull in the good teachers. And that's gonna be on that base salary and the gradients up from there. And being able to pull them in and then keep them here. So that teacher retention plays into that. And then providing them the support they need to be successful in the classroom. Um, so that comes from our, um, Para professionals, they need those education specialists in the classroom to help them to give them the support. Um, we need to keep class sizes manageable for them so that what Jared said, they can have that connection with their kids. If you have 30 kids in a classroom, it is really hard to make connections with those kids. I'm a former educator. I taught in Sioux Falls at a high school in Sioux Falls. I had 150 kids come through my classroom a day each semester. So I saw 300 kids a semester. I still will sometimes see kids around Sioux Falls and yeah, I think I maybe had them and they might recognize me, but I, I didn't have that opportunity to build those connections with the students because my classes were so big. So keeping those class sizes small to allow them to form those relationships because again, the kids that I did was able to form those relationships with as a teacher, those are the ones that still reach out to me on Facebook and still you know, update me on their lives. And it's fun to see what they're doing and to see how they've developed. So I think ultimately that's kind of, when we're asking what my first, my most important thing is <coughs> on that, it's our teachers. We have to give them the support they need. That's it, yeah, sorry, I'm done. <laughs> things without adding in extra things um, there are kids that are not in, into athletics or kids that are not into fine arts and stuff and so some of the things that would be interesting to me 
um, would maybe be like having some intramural groups or some like other interest groups that could potentially be parent-led um, that can give those kids that are not necessarily wanting to compete um, at that higher level, but they just want to go and play dodgeball <laughs> or whatever, you know, it would give them a place to form those connections, form those friendships if they don't necessarily fit into those other groups. Um, the other thing, again, is like keeping those class sizes small and having those connections with the teachers because ultimately those <coughs> teachers are the ones that spend the most time with our students. And if they have the time to really work with those students and form those connections, even as they leave Dell Rapids and they go out into um, their college or um, their workforce career, they have those connections and they have somebody that they can come back to. Um, one of my friend's daughter recently graduated and I know that she has reached out to teachers here in, this, in Del Rapids multiple times about things in college because they have created that relationship and that support system here. So if we have teachers that have the time and availability to really work with students, that helps a ton with mental health. Um, the other thing that we're seeing is kids aren't really finding a safe space to fail. To be able to fail in a safe space and know that they can get back up and do the hard things. And I don't know the answer of how to provide that safe space in this world because I'm a mom that's like, with my youngest daughter, I'm like, I don't really want you crossing Highway 77, you know? <laughs> You're little and it's crazy out there. Um, so we have to balance that as parents of giving them the opportunity to kind of navigate some of those things and to get the confidence to know that they can and those skills and also keeping them safe. But I would absolutely love to talk to people that are professionals in the mental health and find out ways that we can give them a safe space to fail and learn that they are strong enough to get back up again and that it's okay to fall down and you know make a mistake and you can still keep going. So I saw this question on Facebook and of all the questions that came in, like this is the one that kept me up at night. How am I gonna answer this one? And I, I kept trying to think, well, you know, what role does the school board have in, in addressing mental mental health? And um, I, there are several roles. I, I, I believe, but I don't know that it's dictating policy that necessarily um, is where we help in that. We, we talked a little bit about teacher engagement before. Um, and, and so I, I think that has a lot to do. Engaged teachers will engage more with their students. Um, but I'm, I'm going to start with just a quick little story because I, I think we've experienced this with all three of our kids on some different, some level, um, you know, different level with each one of them. Um, and so to me, one of the biggest contributors to mental health issues right now is that darn phone that's in everyone's hand all the time, including mine. And, and so each one of our kids has gotten into some form of trouble um, with that phone uh, that's gotten out of hand. And they've gotten themselves into situations they didn't know how to get themselves out of either. That just like, oh no, I don't know. And we didn't, we didn't find out until we took the phone and found out that they were in these bad situations, nothing terrible, but you know, situations that they, they were uncomfortable <coughs> with it, they didn't know what to do, it was affecting their life, it was affecting their sleep, it was affecting their interactions with us, and that was the biggest giveaway, is that our kids were no longer interacting with us. What we found with each one of our kids, each one of them, when we took that phone away, and it was for a good deal of time, it was a month or two that we were taking the phones away, heck, it might have been three months, but the first time it happened with one of our kids. Our kids changed completely, and I'm not kidding you, they changed completely. They became different people when we took that phone away. They interacted with us. They spent more time upstairs. All their bedrooms are downstairs. Um, they were just much more engaging, and you know, we fell in love with our kids all over again during those periods. I mean, so much so, we didn't want to give the phone back to them, not because we didn't want to have the phone, but because we were so enjoying the relationship. And like, I mean, I just want to take away their phones randomly now just to continue <laughs> to enjoy that relationship. So, um, so I think that's, that's a part of it. And, and I, I also, you know, I hear about things that happen at school and I hear about 
stamp crap whatever <laughs> stuff coming out where they're <laughs> posting stuff about kids and who should be dating who and that kind of thing and it's it hurts kids when they see that they're being paired up with someone that they don't think they should be paired up with and, and so this is all affecting our children so what how does the school board help with that kind of situation I think the school board helps by trying to engage our teachers to um, to recognize that those things are happening because I think the job's hard enough with everything else that they have going on right now that they want to put blinders onto that stuff and not add that to their plate. Um, but they spend more time with their more time with our kids than often we're able to, and and they see those situations and I think they can recognize them and if if we want them to reach out to us, they they got to feel like they're going to have that support to do so and they got to feel like they're engaged enough in their job you know I think every one of us has a teacher or two that we went to school with that we felt like cared about us as an individual you know mine goes all the way back to fifth grade his name was Mr. Rockness I only got to spend one quarter with him because I moved from Brandon to Sioux Falls and I got my last quarter with uh, with Mr. Rockness and um, the way he interacted with me one-on-one -on -one just made me a better human being and the way he interacted with the whole class was just incredible and he brought up every single person that was around him because he was allowed to run his classroom the way he wanted to. Um, when we learned geography <coughs> and we had to memorize all the states in fifth grade, we didn't sit and memorize states. He had a trampoline and a couch and if you could name the right state, you got to jump on the trampoline and land on the couch. <laughs> You didn't want to get the answer wrong, right? Like, that was fun in fifth grade. That's an engaged teacher that's engaging with his students, and I guarantee, well, I know the trouble kid that was in that class. He was in consistent communication back and forth with their parents. Um, even back then, I knew that was happening. So, that's the best answer that I got. Yeah, so I mentioned before I worked at Avera, so um, we have one of the largest uh, behavioral health hospitals in the, in the area. And then I also worked in the ER, so you get to see a lot of the negative effects when the mental health uh, is not well mm -hmm. taken care of. So I'm very passionate about it. Um, we've done a lot over the last several years to try to address it. Uh, we've had seminars both with students and parents around suicide prevention. Uh, we've had it around uh, drugs and alcohol prevention. Um, we've done social media, uh, kind of back to that. We've had both parent and student education on social media. So just trying to address it in those avenues. We've also brought in uh, employee assistance program for our, for our teachers and educators uh, so they can address their mental health um, challenges as well. Uh, so those are just a few things in uh, and kind of talking about networking. My, my brother's a superintendent at a school here in South Dakota and they brought in a, a program that um, addresses seven character traits. And what happens then is all the educators are then taught on this, uh, on these character traits, and then work with the students to develop character traits across the spectrum to make them well-rounded. And then what that does is your your students who do have that strong foundation that can help bring up the other students that might be struggling or maybe don't have that parent at home that's there to to give that to them, because um, those students certainly exist in our district too. So I think we just need to keep keep um, moving forward with those kind of. Uh, initiatives and, and invest in it. It goes back to strategic planning of where are you going to invest your dollars so you can um, so you can uh, address some of those issues. I'm going to take a little bit different slant on your answer. I appreciate everything that Lee just brought up about what the school has done so far. I think that the long-term solution to mental health does not exist in the school, in our school or any other school in the state. I think that the role of the school board in this situation might be to advocate our health care systems for expansion into the schools. It might be to advocate um, for other programs that, um, that don't exist today. I guess, to me, this problem is so much bigger than just the school that addressing it here, it, it seems like a drop in the bucket to compare it to what the actual issue is. Um, and I think mental health right now, whether it's teenagers, whether it's grade schoolers, whether it's adults, I think it's an underserved section of our population and healthcare is only right now starting to get a fringe hold on it, even in Sioux Falls. And you have two healthcare systems, you're right, Avera does have the biggest program, uh, Sanford has a program and I know that there is another program, I can't think of the name of it, um, they just took over a building on 14th and Cliff. That's all they do is mental health. And they have like, I think 20 some different programs and they're still just barely edging it out. 
So for me to say, sit here in front of you and say, I think we have a solution here, I, I can't say that. I think we have to continue to advocate and try to find those connections, but I, it's a much bigger problem than that. Than I think sometimes we're all willing to admit. Good point. What, what we did as a district when we had COVID money, which you know as the schools came in and flooded us, and we had all these decisions to make, one of the things as a school board that we did is we took a bunch of that money and we said, this is going to be an issue. We are going to see the side effects from this for years. We had counselors. We had the program that Lee had talked about for the staff. And that was in, extremely important to us as a board. Um, and that's what we chose to do with a bunch of those dollars. Those dollars are going away, and there is no plan to go away with what we've, been, we've already put in. So that's, that's what I can say. Right, okay, so uh, the biggest thing is to, like, like we've talked about with some of the problems, right, is to, the best way to handle something in this case is, is to preempt it as much as you can, right? And I think where that action takes place the most is, is as we've discussed, with the interaction between the teachers and the students on the one and one level. And as much as we can provide teachers with an opportunity to do that um, inside the school, that's that's the best way to handle that. Um, you know, Dan really took my speaking point, right? So this this is the problem. Um, you know, for a kid growing up watching Star Trek The Next Generation, if you had even told me that I was going to be able to hold a pad in my hand when I was a grown up, I don't know if I would have believed you all the way. Um, but like, like any double-edged sword, all the awesome things it can do, it can really do some terrible things too. So, um, you know, I would even go so, so far as to say I would support getting rid of this in our school system. With the caveat that I know that's not up to me. In this, in this society, this is everywhere, including our teachers. We have a generation of teachers now teaching and grew up with this too. Um, that would be a superintendent decision and it would require buy in at every level. But it's something that I would definitely support. Uh, and then, just kind of in a philosophical sense, right at the end here, we need to model leadership at every level. That's something the board can do. That's something teachers do every single day. Um, there's, I'm going to be a little harsh here. There's, there is uh, a little bit of a culture of victimhood in America right now, and a lot of it comes from the echo chamber and this device. We need to remind our <coughs> kids that it's rarely as bad as it seems in the moment. That's the biggest way to deal with mental health, right? Because Every one of us here, is, if we have kids, has probably had that some variation of that conversation where the kid tells you, you were never my age and you have no idea what's going on in your life. And um, what they're really asking for is some sort of understanding that they're not alone in the moment. And that's how you head off those things. And I think our teachers do that every day. And I think the guidance counselors have a lot of excellent resources. And I think, generally speaking, we do an excellent job mitigating mental health problems. Um, but yes, it's not something that's going to go away. Uh, it's certainly not. Um, and as, as the, the people that control these devices and control us learn to, to do it better and better, it's going to get harder to mitigate that problem. So. Uh, I'm, mental health is it, it, it's such a huge thing. Uh, I have a, a child who is dealing with anxiety issues and things, and um, you know, to watch a child go through that is it's heartbreaking. Um, but like Jared said, it is bigger than the school. It's bigger than you know the the five people that sit on the board. Um, it doesn't mean we can't do our part, and. I think again that does tie to you know that, that teacher connection because they are kind of that along with parents are the front line to what our children are dealing with, um, and sometimes more so than parents because you know if they if 
students are able to form that good connection with the teacher, a student might feel more comfortable going to them than a parent. I know, you know, I've had stuff brought to my attention that I maybe wasn't <coughs> by a teacher, and so then I can have that conversation with my child. So allowing our, again, teachers to have that time, those small class sizes, allowing to make those connections um, is kind of a, a first line defense a little bit. Um, but again, it's, it's bigger than, than us, unfortunately. And it's, it's gonna take a lot of partnerships between you know, schools and healthcare and you know, employers and kind of everybody coming together to, to tackle that problem in the next you know, decades. Yeah. Yeah, mental health is an epi epidemic right now um, that we're facing, unfortunately. And I don't think it's going to get any easier, um, as everybody else has said, with the advances in technology. Um, as far as how do we address it in the schools with the school board, um, you know, coming if I if I were to come in, I'd want to understand what what are we currently, what all do we have in place, right? What all do we have in place? And then I would want to talk to our mental health professionals that are in the schools and say, where is the need? What are you seeing? Where is the need? And then from there, can we make a strategic plan on how, how can we implement additional things, resources, to help support those kids um, throughout mental health, um, with their mental health? Um, and I know it's hard because mental health is so difficult because there's so much privacy around it, right? Um, so if students are going to the counselors and they're telling them things that are concerns that are on their heart that you know are on their minds and the counselors are sort of hands tied in certain scenarios. Obviously, they're can, what you consider um, a mandated report, right? So if there's something that's related to abuse, neglect, whatever those things, they have they're mandated to report those things. But for a lot of these things, they can't just outright call up a parent and say, you know, I talked to your daughter today and there's this stuff going on and this stuff going on and this stuff going on and I'm really concerned, but how can we pull our community members in and make initiatives to better um, support our kids too? Because I think at the, at, the, at the very basis of mental health, it starts at home, right? So what, what are the needs and what can we implement in the schools? Like, find out what can we make as a plan um, moving forward, like where do the issue, what are the major issues we're seeing, and what kinds of things can we maybe talk about to try to implement to resolve some of those issues within the district, right, um, just to help support those things. Again, like everybody else has said, it is a bigger issue than just the schools, right? Um, but how can we all work together and I think some of that is reaching out to the community members too. Um, and saying, this is the problem that's been identified. Like maybe we can make a initiative to, you know, I don't know. I don't know what that looks like. You know, some of it is just understanding first and then making a plan and then implementing the solution. Um, so it's hard to speak to specific things for, for, for that. But I think the, at the very basis, the first thing that you have to do is talk to the people that are at the front lines of it. You know, because they, they know the most, right? Um, but it's a huge problem, huge problem. And we, we certainly need to um, try to find ways to better help support our children. Um, and, you know, I think in addition to the, 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 yeah, the, the social media thing is huge, the bullying, those things, we need to look at all of those different things. And, and, and again, what are we currently doing? What's working? What's not working? What can we maybe, I mean, they're, they're really intelligent people um, in our community. They might have some fantastic <laughs> ideas. And it might be simple <coughs> things that don't require a lot of money, right? Um, again, it's that outside of the box thinking that we have to have. Um, and, and again, it also starts at home, so it's getting, it's getting everybody within the community to work together, to think together, um, to move together. Because just as we, um, you know, all go to support our athletes at a sporting event, or we all go to support the kids um, at their fine arts events, at their plays, at their, like, we can make a huge change as a community if we all work together to do it. I appreciate your answers, and I did not expect anybody to have a magic wand answer. <laughs> <laughs> I 
I got 8.15, so we <laughs> may be at our final question here, depending on how long this goes. So it's been brought up many times about the teacher crisis. Um, we are just on the brink of it. Our teachers are leaving, and they're leaving in droves. What is your creative ideas that you look to bring to the board on how do we keep our teachers and what do we do when they leave and we can't fill those positions? Because some of those positions don't get filled, not because we don't want them filled, but because there's nobody to fill them. There's no applicants. Um, our paraprofessionals are one of them. That there's constantly advertisements for paraprofessionals and we can't fill them. Substitute teachers are another one. Um, tomorrow, there's teachers that may not get prep time in the high school at all because they're being pulled to, to sub. So what are your creative solutions to fill that when there's nobody there? I mean, we can throw money at it, but that's not always the answer. Um, how do we get these people to want to come to Del Rapids to work for Del Rapids School? Thanks for the question. That's the one thing I didn't get a chance to talk about yet in detail. So uh, I was hoping I'd get a final like time to talk about something, and that would be it. Um, the where to start with this whole thing? Um, so our teachers are leaving. Hey, boy, I'm going to struggle to get my words put together here. One of the things that I've been recommending that we move forward with um, is an engagement survey. Um, that engagement survey has stemmed from some of my interactions with a couple of the teachers that, that we have at the school. Um, and the, the teachers, frankly, are, are pretty darn tight-lipped. I mean, they, they try and be incredibly professional, um, but when, when you read around the edges, you, you understand that they, in ways, don't feel like they are being supported um, by, by their bosses. Um, and so I think it's important that we, that we kind of understand what is the role of the school board um, in the city of Bill Rapids and to the school. And, and so, like any business, the, the town of Del Rapids owns the schools. It's your school, right? The people that are hired at that school, the teachers, the principal, uh, the superintendent, are frankly your employees. The school board is hired to be the head of those employees that we have, to make decisions, to set vision. But they are not there to micromanage every little part of what's happened. That's why you hire people who have degrees, understand what they're doing. I, I have no idea how to tell a teacher to go how to teach, and that's absolutely not what you need me on a school board to do. What you need someone on a school board to do is to create an environment where teachers want to, want to succeed. Um, I'll give you an example of a teacher that I experienced here in Del Rapids. So I was, I was on, on the, the set, I was building um, something for, uh, for Moana, or who knows what it was, I think it was Moana. <laughs> um, and there was a teacher who was sitting out with kids all around the table. And there was one of the kids at the table that asked her for feedback, um, just about kind of who he was at a person, what he was good at, content of his character. She gave feedback to that person. And then all the rest of the kids surrounded her, all wanting that same kind of feedback. Um, about themselves. Now that is an engaged teacher because she was able to give each and every one of those kids a very individualized uh, feedback plan for them and they were so engaged in it throughout the entire thing. Um, so we, we do have some engaged teachers but we have some that don't seem to be and there seems to be some animosity that exists there. What an engagement survey does for those that haven't been you know put through one in corporate America is it really gets out and it asks those questions in an anonymous way so that we can see, okay, is this an isolated incident with just a few teachers and we need to just work on that? Or are there pockets? Is it, is it one supervisor who seems to have a whole team that's disengaged? Is it, in our case, one whole school that seems to be entirely disengaged? And then we have to take action on those results because until we... Uh, until we make sure that that team is all working together and going in the same direction, um, we're just 
we're not going to become that Harrisburg district, that T district. When my wife, my wife was a teacher, when she was applying for jobs and she'd go apply it in Harrisburg or Brandon, um, she wasn't applying for the one job opening and they were grateful to have her like we have around here. There were 30, 40, 50, 100 applicants um, for the job that she was applying for because that's where the people wanted to work because they had created an environment where people talked well of the school, of the leadership, of the town and community that was behind them. And, and so we need to, we, we've got some work to do in that area. And I don't mean to be down about it because so, so much good stuff happens and I don't know that anything's been done intentionally to create that, but, um, but it, it, it just, it, it seems to be there, it seems to fester, it doesn't appear to, to, be, um, to be getting addressed and that is the role of the school board to come forward to our employees and say, hey, it appears that we've got a problem here. We need to get to the bottom of it. That is your responsibility to find out what's going on and, and make a plan to address that. Um, that that's engagement survey is first thing. I, I mean, that would be first month that I think we need to uh, jump on top of in this next school year. So the school board is in place to hire the leadership that then sets the culture of the school. And so that's essentially what it comes down to. And I think working in a similar uh, uh, industry where we have nursing shortages and nursing turnover, it really comes, what, what I found the most success in is creating an environment where the employees uh, feel valued, supported, and appreciated. So to me, that's kind of the, that's the guiding principle that we just need to continue to instill. Um, obviously, uh, we have new leadership in place right now that are trying to set a culture. And so we do keep our ear to the ground as far as, uh, you know, what are we hearing from our educators? What are we hearing from our students? Um, and those kind of things. And then obviously engaging with Dr. DeBoer um, and uh, to see what, what are the things that we're doing to, to impact uh, those three items that I just shared. So I think that's, uh, that those are all things that we listen to and hopefully have some influence over, uh, and that's kind of the that's kind of the extent that I've worked. It's a really good question. I don't know how to completely answer it. Um, like everything else, I'm not on the school board currently, so I don't know everything that you've done. You alluded to some of the things that are currently going on. Having had staff in the past, I can speak to similar things like Lee. It's engagement. It's listening to the staff. It's when we're doing, historically, when I was managing different departments, we were going to do a capital budget. It came from the staff. It didn't come from me. That way, when I was fighting for our budgets, I was fighting for what their needs were. Um, I'm not saying that's not happening. I'm just, that's the mentality I have. So um, I guess a thing that I would want to do moving forward, if you're on the school board, if you're on the administration, you do need to have your ear to the ground and listen to it, talk to people frequently. One thing I would be curious to know about, and maybe you two know this, because um, I don't, is are there any school districts that are going to our our upper education schools like Dakota State, SDSU, where we have teachers coming out of now, and we're understanding what those kids, that next generation of teachers is also looking for, what are their concerns, and maybe being proactive in anticipating other needs that might be there. Do you know if that's happening currently? I know we're working with those, but but I, I, I can't tell you that we've interviewed those, the teacher, you know, the students that are coming out. Okay. You know, all we hear is it mostly is pay. Okay. And that's why they're not going, you know, they get out and they're not. So I would say Jason hit it on the head with that, was it Forbes article or whatever it was. Um, it is, I mean, I think we are 11th, 10th or 11th um, in the conference right now as far as teacher pay. So, uh, base pay, I should say, base pay. So, uh, we need to get the base pay up to attract new teachers coming out of school. Um, that, that is a critical need. And so, just, that does happen kind of in negotiations, which will be coming up soon. So, um, I think Clay's on that team. Sorry. <laughs> so, thank you for that information. Again, I don't know all of these things, but the only thing I can figure is, let's, 
if, if there is a current issue, we need to keep listening to it and keep addressing it. But moving forward, it needs to be a proactive approach. We need to address people as they're coming in, right as they're coming out of college, and try to find ways to do that. Because it's, if it's, it appears like it is, it's only going to get worse. And it's across many industries right now. And um, I think any industry is going to have to stay proactive to keep adjusting and being, I want to say malleable, but they have to be positioned to adjust um, within the scope of what they can do, either per government or per budget. So. I, I guess the one thing is, you know, teaching is, is very difficult. We hear that all the time. It, it's behaviors in the classroom have changed, just like we talked about mental health. That's become a huge challenge to many of the teachers, so we've got to look at that. Um, I, I, stu I know pay is not the, but it is a giant part of this this situation we, we have got to work on that the one thing I can do as a school board member is class size that that is the one thing that I really can control or try to help control to take some of that off of the teachers that, that's really the only <coughs> only thing that I can do um, besides increased pay um, and maybe give them some behavioral help at some point that was the, the things I see okay so all, again, all great stuff. Uh, just on the retention bit, a piece uh, one more time to the, to the very first part of your question. Uh, teach, teachers talk to one another, right? So usually, um, you know, who's ever going to come out of the wings to replace a teacher when they go is, is probably already interacted with the school, either through their relationship with the teacher that's there, or whatever, right? So we need to empower right our teachers to do the best that they can um, as, as we talked about right they're, they're professionals it's a high performance job uh, we need to provide a vision and then how they achieve that um, should be left mostly to them right and I'll draw the, I'll, in a second, I'll draw the distinction between what I think of strategic planning and what's operational planning and execution, right? Um, I think there's an underlying current, both in, in some of the students and some of the teachers right now, there's this feeling that they're being penalized for failing to achieve a goal that they didn't know they were supposed to achieve. Um, and I'll, kind of, I'll come to that with, you know, there are conversations we're having where we're talking about um, student-teacher interaction down to the minute, right? How many minutes of interaction are teachers having? Who cares, right? Are we achieving the goal? We should not be planning our teachers' days down to the minute. Because if we are, that means that we failed to set a vision as a school board, and we failed then operationally to set goals that are relevant to what those teachers need to accomplish in their jobs, okay? So that's where it starts, and that's the difference between what I'm saying and strategic planning and the operational planning. So what happens at the administrative level and then below, okay? Um, but that strategic planning needs to start with something like what Dan said, right? An engagement um, survey. And I would, sorry I'm gonna throw down the gauntlet a little bit, but I would encourage the board to actually execute one of those before the end of the year. Could easily be done. And then we could action on that, say at the end of the semester, if who's ever on the board then, get action on that at the end of the, the first semester of next year for comparative, comparative information, right? I'm going I'm to talk about the process of strategic planning one more time because I haven't said it 300 times yet. So <laughs> get that. And I'll just use a little anecdote, I guess, from my life, right? So in my last job in the Army, I was uh, the head of an ROTC program at a university. Um, it's a chair-level position. I had seven employees under me. And um, I reported to the, to the dean of the College of Liberal Arts. And so what strategic planning looked like that, it, just to give you an idea of what I did, was the first year I did nothing. I went there, I figured out what, what is this program, who are these people that are working for me, who are the students, and what are the goals that we need to achieve, both mandated goals, things we absolutely have to achieve, and then vision goals. What are the things that we want to achieve to become better, right? And then I laid out in a very simple one-page memo 
the things that I expected to see. And then I left my instructors to do their job. Because over the course of that year, I had seen what they were made of, I'd seen how they operated, and I understood that they were professionals and that they knew what they needed to do. Um, in addition to that, as a leader, because it was a personnel crunch, right? something that we, we are and may be dealing with, right? I, did, I took an, an unusual step in that I, I taught the freshman class, normally the guy, the guy in my position would be in charge of the seniors, but I took the freshmen and the seniors to help alleviate some of that stress of time and time management so that those people that work for me can just do what they were supposed to do. So my point there is that in the planning process, we need to identify ways that we can, A, set a vision goal and achievable goals within the confines of the things that we have to do or required to do. And then we need to let the teachers do their thing. And if they're not meeting the goals, then we can remediate if we need to. But I, I definitely feel that there's this undercurrent of, you know, what are we supposed to be doing and what are we not doing? And, and why? Um, so, strategic planning, strategic planning, strategic planning. Right? <laughs> we need an engagement um, survey, just like just like Dan said. And then we need to go in, and we need to have an an expanded um, discussion of all the shareholders and stakeholders. And that looks like leadership that's in this room, it looks like community that's in this room, it is teachers from all the schools, it is students from all the schools. Large and small group engagement over time, and then as we set that vision and we set those goals, those <coughs> requirements, then we, can, then we can proceed with the plan from the top down. And then we fit resources into that plan as appropriate. Some of those resources are money, some of those resources are time. <coughs> but let's hit on, on the retention piece, right? We need to look at the time that we give our teachers as a form of compensation. Right? So we've already established that we're not paying them enough to be competitive. Uh, we, we, we've identified that in the new schedule there's going to be less time for the teachers. That's one of the things that we can't argue about, right? Uh, we, need to, we need to consider the fact that maybe that time is one of those compensation factors for our teachers, and we need to address that. Uh, when we're talking about the schedule change, um, several school board meetings ago, one of the things that we sort of glossed over, you know, is this idea of, you know, changing to a standard schedule of seven, seven periods, but then also in one of the scenarios, you could have a, a study hall that's built into it. It's my understanding that you do that, you add a few minutes on the front and the end of the day, and you take a couple minutes from each class, and you get a roughly a half a period that, that goes into planning. Um, that's one of the retention strategies that I think would be a valuable implementation to keeping retaining, and it's an alternative form of compensation, right? Because we might not be able to pay the most, but if we can provide some time in the middle of the day where the teachers feel like they have their own space and they can do whatever they need to do. That's also a value add um, for the teachers. Because we're not gonna get to competitive base pay. And, and Lee was right, and when you go to average teacher pay, we're, we're, we're dead last in our district. Um, you know, so we need to look at all the things that our teachers look at as compensation that they understand as compensation and that starts with the engagement survey and it and it builds from there in other discussions that gradually lead to a strategic plan uh well if we take the money off the table because i think ultimately we know that that is a big big factor in it. I think when teachers are leaving, that would probably be one of the things that is definitely on the list. But if we take that off the table, I think it uh, it does ultimately boil down to what kind of culture are we creating 
in our school, in our school district for those teachers. Um, I can tell you in my teaching career, I taught in five different schools. Um, most of those are in Sioux Falls. Um, that in itself was one of the reasons I left um, teaching because I taught uh, uh, CTE, as I said, and they would just move me randomly to wherever school needed me the next year. Um, and so my last assignment was a culture that I did not want to be in. Um, it was not an area I wanted to teach. Um, in full disclosure, it was middle school. God bless you, middle school teachers. <laughs> Thank God there are people like you that do love to teach the middle schoolers, but it was not for me. And that was where I got moved. And so I was ultimately in a school that was not for me, and it was a culture that I did not feel like I was supported or valued. Um, I felt like the only time I saw my principal was when they had something to tell me that I had done wrong. And um, they did not support me as a teacher and value my, at that point, nine years of teaching experience. I was not a brand new teacher anymore. Um, so we have to support our teachers in the fact that they do know what they're doing. <coughs> we hired them, and we believe if our administrators have hired them to do their job and they feel like they're the best candidate for the job, then let's let them do their job and let's tr trust them to do their job. And we have the standards, but let's trust that they are meeting those standards. Um, and so giving them that you know, ability to kind of control their classroom within those confines, um, I think really makes a big difference. I know for me when I was teaching, the, the ability to do my classroom how I needed to do it was one of the most important things to me that made me feel the most valued um, and not getting micromanaged all the time, which I did not have at the end. And now I'm an accountant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I agree. Um, base pay is probably something, obviously, is something that needs to be looked at, certainly. But it goes beyond that, um, and the culture is a huge thing. It is in any industry. So, like, in the industry that I work in, for example, um, it's a, it's a culture-driven industry, or a culture-driven world in any industry you work in, right? So what are, what are some things that you can implement to make the teachers in our school district feel more valued? And sometimes it doesn't have to be big things, it can be little things, right? Um, some of the things that we have implemented where I work is just, it's as simple as doing like a recognition platform, like sending out a hey to everybody, thank you for what you just did today, whatever. You know, just that thank you is small, right? Or maybe it's a small, like, I caught you doing something great. Here's here's a gift card to um, County Fair. Or here's a gift card to S S Subway. Or here's this or that or whatever. Just a small token of thanks sometimes can speak the loudest to the teachers. So it's like, can't we implement small little things? And maybe you already do these things. I don't know. Um, but the culture of showing people and doing things to show people that you appreciate them is so important, I think, in any industry right now. Um, for job satisfaction, and I think that that helps with retention. Um, so what, again, and you know, I feel like a broken record too, what are we currently doing? Because obviously I'm not, I'm not in, in that role right now. I don't, I don't really know everything, but I need to learn a lot more, obviously, right? So what are we currently doing? What's working, what's not? I think the teacher engagement survey is a really good place to start because you need to hear from the teachers themselves. What do you like about working here? What don't you like about working here? You know, like, what what are some problems that we need to look at? If there is a huge common theme or pattern that and a major issue that is identified, obviously we need to try to look at that and what can we do to correct it or what can we implement to make it better? Um, because at the end of the day, uh, it can't just be about money. Um, you know, obviously teaching, teaching is just <coughs> unfortunately one of those fields where the pay isn't, as great as it is in other occupations, right? But the people who go into those fields do it because they have a passion for our kids. They have a passion to teach our kids. They do it because they love our kids. You know, just as just as much as we do. But I also rely on those teachers to to be the experts in their field. I'm not a teacher. I, I you know, like, and it, it's difficult having a child who, um, like I said, is in the special education program as a parent, like. Sometimes it's like, 
what I, I don't I don't know how to help like you know and and so having the teacher to rely the communication back and forth the support from the parents the support from the community it's huge and I think um, you know there's there just needs to be some more open dialogue about what we have going on in the school district so parents are well informed of everything that we have going on and then parents can give their opinions or their thoughts or like hey maybe we could look at doing this like you know what that's a great idea just trying to encourage more engagement with the board um, as a community to move things forward I think is 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 if the teachers feel supported by the parents, by the community, um, by each other, by the students, um, it just creates a positive culture and somewhere that people will want to work. And that's what we, I mean, I, I, and I think that's going to help with retention and trying to keep people, yeah, I'll sub, you know, um, because it's a great place to be. And I love it here. And I love the people I work with. And I love the administration, and I love you know whatever. That that's what you that's what that goal right. That's a goal in every industry, I think. Um, you know, and there's there's a huge focus on it now. Um, but we probably need to be doing a, a better job. You know, and and maybe not. Maybe we're doing it perfectly. I have to guess we're probably not. Um, but finding out from the teachers right now, getting their intake. <coughs> is, is I think key in being able to develop a strategic plan on what things can we implement to make this a better place for them to work. So this is a big piece for me, teacher retention, because um, I do feel like we're looking at losing, we've already <coughs> lost several good teachers and we're looking at potentially losing some other really good teachers. Um, one of the things personally when I was a paraprofessional in the elementary <coughs> school, I'm not an educator. I did not go to school for this. I had no training other than just being a mom. <coughs> and one of the things I found out as I spent my years as a paraprofessional is there's not a ton of training for paraprofessionals. And you get thrown into situations that you have absolutely no idea how to handle. And you just deal with it. And when I chose to leave, it was not because I didn't love our schools and not because I didn't love our kids, but it was because when I went home at the end of the day, I had nothing left of me to give to my own kids. And that's my first job, is to be a mom. And I can only imagine what our teachers in our school systems deal with when they're trying to create curriculums and teach multiple different classes and deal with all the behaviors and everything else on top of it. And one of the things that stuck out to me when we were discussing the schedule change is <coughs> one of the board members asked Mr. Bunkers, um, can our teachers handle this? Can they handle the extra students that are gonna go through their classes? Can they handle the less time prepping? And the answer was, <coughs> if you have really good teachers, they'll find a way and in my head, like I wanted to stand up and I'm like, should we be asking them to? Should we be asking them to put that much more on their plate? But we've discussed mental health. We've discussed, you know, how much our teachers do and everything that's expected of them and the low pay. And you put all that together and of course they're leaving. I have a job right now and I'll be honest with you, it is not the best paying job. I could go get another job that pays a lot more, but you know what I like about it? is I walk in the door, I do my job, I walk out, I do not have to think about it. Another minute, I walk out and it is done. I have zero stress at that job. The other benefit at that job is the culture is great. The people there want us to be there and they recognize us for being there. Every time I bring something up, they're like, hey, that was a really good catch. It's the recognition of the small things. We get free coffee brought to us once a month, whatever we want from scooters. <laughs> and it's like, just for showing up, like, here's the coffee. Not a big deal, but it makes you feel kind of nice. You know, um, they do lots of things to make you feel very appreciated and valued there and that they want you to show up every day. And so I don't know, Angie had great ideas. And there's, again, we have great community here. I'm sure the coffee shop implement some program or the traveling 
coffee place. There are ways that we can make our teachers feel appreciative and want to be here beyond just the base pay and it's just thinking outside the box, implementing things. But beyond that, if our teachers don't feel like they're heard and respected and valued, they're not gonna stay. When I was asking teachers what they thought about the schedule change, one of them said, we don't have a lot of perks. Pay is what it is. I knew that going into the teaching profession, this is one of the perks. No other teachers in the district have this, or in the conference or whatever have this, this is one of our perks. And we took it away from them. So I th we have to listen to our teachers. They're telling us what they want. They're telling us what's important to them. And if we listen to them, we'll have people say. Just a little bit just just position for the current board members, I guess, as somebody who does work for the school. I will also say, like, yes, we have a problem with people leaving the teaching profession, but we also have educators who here who have started their career here and have ended their career here, or have started their career here and have every intention of ending their career here. Mm -hmm. So, I do think the current school board and our current administrators are doing a lot of really good things with everything. Culture changes and society changes, and our kids change. So then. We have to change and we have to be flexible. And we don't always figure that out as fast as we could or as fast as we should. And, um, but I would say I appreciate the current school board and the um, administrators that we have providing us the grace for some time to figure out some of that. Because do, we do see teachers. We may not, we see teachers leaving the profession, but in, I worked in three, well, I worked in two different school districts and I was an intern in three different school districts. Um, and we retain teachers for much longer than a lot of districts around us. I mean. And we have fantastic teachers in our district. I just have to say, you know, I really do. We, we have fantastic teachers here. A lot of them who have like built their Been careers here. for a very long time, yep. Mm -hmm. Because the community is, I mean, that's why I'm here. Um, that's why I raised my children here, because I love this community. I just, I just want to say uh, to Lee and Troy, first off, thank you for your service. And to everybody up here, thank you for putting your name on the line and running. It's really refreshing to find this happen an election for school board. Uh, it hasn't happened for quite some time. And so I really appreciate everybody putting their name out there, coming here tonight, putting your ideas out there to the public. Um, so I just really appreciate it. And it's really nice to be on this side, <laughs> not up there for once. So thank you. Thanks, Tom. <laughs> Yes, thank you all. Thanks, Thanks everyone for coming. Thank yeah. Thank <laughs> you.